pretty wonderful weather. Other you, and, and I love the fact that I don't know if you hear that awesome crackling thunder right overhead. <laughs> Watch me die on camera. Um, I, I love that I'm back home now, back in the Midwest, uh, where storms like this happen. They were very much missed when I was living out in California. Yeah, there's Bart and uh, an oofed at a Bart. This is totally a sunspot thing I'm stealing. Uh, but uh, Bart is uh, just becoming my favorite uh, uh, viewer and reader as he has gone through my uh, YouTube library, commenting all the way, and now he's reading my book. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. And, and do let me know if you have any questions about any of the stories I cover. Um, I, I really love getting that live feedback uh, from a book that's been out for a, a while. So I just it doesn't happen as much anymore. And uh, yeah, who knows? I, it's raining on me and I'm fighting the sun. It's always something. Uh, so let's, uh, as this is a history based, uh, you know, this came out, this, uh, this series that I'm doing came out as a way to provide some free entertainment for people as we were in our uh, stay at home orders for a long time. I think this is episode eight or nine now. Um, Obviously, the world has opened up in a lot of big ways, but we're not out of the woods yet. We are still living in some very historic times. Obviously, in addition to the pandemic, that is an ongoing uh, struggle. Um, we are living through a historic time where it's there's just so much civic unrest, civil unrest. It has toned down quite a lot compared to uh, earlier in this month, but it's still um, it's not totally peaceful. And Madison just got a lot more violent yesterday, last night, um, and. Uh, you know, I, I think so many wonderful things are resulting in all of these protests, but, you know, you hate for it to get actually physically violent or, or people are getting hurt. Um, so just kind of uh, mentioning that because these are kind of moments in time that we are doing this through. Uh, read, uh, Bart is chiming in, read the book in two sittings and it was very, it was very interesting and entertaining. Um, that is what, thank you so much. That's very kind. I, I try to be as an author, um, very easy to read, you know, as far as I hope I'm captivating you, but also uh, that it's, uh, you know, easy to digest. Uh, it's funny with uh, the Fantastic Story Society, two weeks in a row, we had on um, DJ McHale, who created Are You Afraid of the Dark? And then we had John Ronson, who, of course, wrote um, uh, The um, Men Who Stare at Goats and many other great books. And both of them, we asked, like, what defines your work? And they both said, like, I don't write literature. I, I want this to be very conversational uh, feeling. And I think that's uh, pretty true of mine as well. Um, and it's always such a weird thing. I think, you know, I spent years working on this book. In 1999, I did a documentary, but that really just kicked off my research. And then by 2003 is really when the book came out. So about four-ish years of research. And um, it's a double-edged thing. I put all this time into it and I'm really happy that people enjoy it. But then it's like, oh man, that took you two days to read. <laughs> it took me four years to write. Uh, but that's, that's the nature of writing versus reading um, and fact checking and research, 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 research. Uh, but I'm really, really glad and thankful um, that, that you uh, enjoyed it. But really quickly, uh, just going over what else is going on. Yes, um, cases in America are, are really going up when it comes to uh, COVID-19. And there's always debate over what do cases really mean. First off, testing is great. The more tests we get, the better. We should be very proud of the fact that we're doing so much testing. It's a definitely not a black eye. It's, it's something to be prideful of. And knowledge is always good. You know, the, the more we can know about what's going on out there, the better we can handle everything. So it's, it's really a, a wonderful thing. Uh, right now, uh, as of today, the Texas governor is urging people to stay home. It's not a stay-at-home order, but it's uh, definitely a step in that direction as Texas is thinking that they might be at hospital capacity by the 4th of July, which is not too far away. Uh, Arizona is uh, going into a hospital emergency protocol as they are still below that curve. We always talk about flattening, flattening the curve. Uh, they're approaching that, that mark. They're not there yet. Uh, on the positive side, um, well, there's a lot of positives, and I always want to lean towards the positives. Uh, our daily death count has continued to drop. We are still at a high number. It's over 500. Um, right now, Brazil, Mexico, and sometimes India, depending on how they report, goes higher than us. Uh, but whatever the case, it's still way better than when we had 2,000 uh, deaths a day. Uh, hopefully, we can keep that trajectory going. Okay, so other good news. I, I did this impromptu episode on Friday where I continued to talk about paranormal TV, including some of the uh, my own personal experiences uh, with it. Uh, that was kind of an unannounced one. But in that one, I mentioned that a guy by the name of Corey Wolchering 
was going for this incredible record and the yeah i'll just cut to the chase he got the record it's amazing it was the uh the ice age trail which cuts all along from northwestern wisconsin cuts into like central wisconsin close to the illinois border around janesville and then Go, cuts back up towards uh, Door County, Wisconsin, 1,200 miles. And he did it in, uh, it was 21 days, um, 17 hours, or maybe that was the previous record. But 20, uh, 1,200 miles he ran back to back, and he broke the record. Uh, so huge congrats to him. Hats off to him. Abigail is asking what my book is called. It is uh, Voices from the Chicago Grave. Um Yes. Oh, so this is, uh, Bart brings up a comment, and hello, Greg Lawson, who's also arrived. This is something also that I wanted to, to mention uh, briefly when it comes to, to COVID, because we want to tell some ghost stories, too. And that's what, uh, that's the other part of what this is all about, is uh, the idea that European countries will be banning travel to or from uh, America. And that is, you know, as a, uh, as this ghost story person, I love visiting all sorts of wild places, which is something that we are covering today as we're talking about East Coast places. So right now, that's where we are sitting, that it might be more and more difficult for us as Americans to travel across the world because we're coming from a, a, um, a very impacted area. And and ideally, uh, well, obviously, ideally, that wouldn't happen because we'd have our stuff under control. Uh, but that's, gonna, that's starting to happen on the state level now, too, as we see a lot of Eastern uh, New England town, uh, cities, uh, states that have got hit really hard and now they've recovered now they don't want people from some of these more impacted states to come on in without quarantining so you know again it's it's a big 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 issue but just you know socially distance wear masks it's all about safety uh, we all ob obey the speed limit it's a similar idea we all conform to a certain standard with the point of being safe uh, everybody safe uh, one more positive story. Uh, shout out to my dad, who was honored, uh, and happy Father's Day. Uh, I I'll talk to him as well, but uh, happy Father's Day here, and all the dads out there, happy Father's Day. But he was recognized as a distinguished alumni of Mundlion High School. So proud of him in a million ways, and that's just one more to add on to it. Okay, so now, uh, the I love doing these icebreaker questions because it kind of shows me what a wonderful group of friends I have. Uh, all of the, you in Facebook land, I, I love doing these. Uh, it's such a variety of different answers. And, uh, and I, I couldn't believe how many people responded to this because I just posted this question last night. And my question was, what's geeky about you? Neil Halford and his wife, uh, Jana, uh, this is a, actually a really great segue because they created an online virtual uh, sci-fi convention. And that is called the Lockdown Con. And that is happening just later in this year. And if anybody's a fan of sci-fi it's uh, or science in general, tech, writing, being creative, LockdownCon.com is where you want to go check it out. And uh, a, a number of people responded talking about that they go to sci-fi conventions and whatnot. And I've been to a whole bunch of them as well. Um, so this is a way we can virtually do that. And I've missed out, obviously, on so many awesome paranormal conferences that I usually uh, have been to by this point in the year. So, um, so Rachel Meyer, uh, said sci-fi pretty open-ended. Uh, oh, Abigail, uh, your brother, my brother calls me a nerd every time I wear my doctor who shirt. Okay. So your brother got his watch his ass because when people ask me, are you a star Wars or star Trek fan? I say, I'm a doctor who fan, nothing against those other franchises, but doctor who is pretty awesome. And I will a little bit of name dropping right this second. Uh, I was able to meet one time Alice Cooper, and I was wearing a Dalek t-shirt, Doctor Who t-shirt, Daleks, and he said, whoa, cool, Doctor Who, and then he and I talked about Doctor Who, and that's what our conversation was. So listen, if Alice Cooper thinks it's cool, uh, I think it's your brother. Maybe that's not the cool one in this story. Um, so uh, Tim Budzinski, uh, nerd expertise is time travel, and of course I asked him, I was like, are you talking about movies or novels or the real thing? And he said, all of the above, I have a handful of nonfiction time travel books. Uh, so that's awesome. I love time travel uh, theories and conspiracies. If anybody ever watched that old uh, reel from Charlie Chaplin's The Circus, where it looks like a woman in the silent era is talking on a, uh, a cell phone. Uh, I know that was making the rounds for a while there. Uh, John Coolis, of course, he's going to say bass. He's the ultimate bassist. We know the, the, 
the guys from Cheap Trick are big fans of John Coolis. Um, Andrea uh, Babineau, who is a good production friend of mine from living in L.A., uh, collectibles, signed prints, comics, manga, movies, sports, going to comic cons and sporting events, season ticket holders. Uh, so she's really into. Uh, she lives in New Orleans now, which fairly good ghost story town as well. Uh, but yes, yeah, she is a big sports nerd, and her collectibles range from anime, comic book heroes and villains, action figures, uh, almost a full collection of Sailor Moon cards. Max Tim chimes in, forgot to comment on the geeky question, taught myself the elven language in college from Lord of the Rings. Okay, I think we, maybe we can stop. I think Max just won. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> you really did. I, Max is an uh, amazing fan of Tolkien, and I, I will always remember the first... Uh, we were living in L.A. together, still in college, when the trailer for The Two Towers came out, and there was some narration that was going on, on during it, and Max grabbed his book and opened it right to the page where the narration was coming from. Uh, yeah, he knows his stuff. Patty Vasquez, uh, my ridiculous ability to spout facts about Lincoln. So, yeah, the thing is about geek culture or being geeky, it's whatever excites you. It doesn't have to be, you know, your typical comic books or whatever. I am wearing a uh, Venture Brothers t-shirt, by the way, just to kind of fit into this uh, the conversation of nerddom. But anything that really excites you to a level that um, other people might say, it's a little much, uh, that's definitely geek. Uh, Cody Novak, another f friend from Zany, Zany's uh, Comedy Club. He, ha he knows dumb amounts of information about Nikola Tesla. And he's also a Batman fanatic and has played every gaming console. Uh, that's awesome. I wish I had time to get dive more into these two. Mark Fairchild, neighbor, just uh, just over yonder. Um, I have every Brewer's bobblehead times two from 2007 on. He only missed a couple things that were, um, you know, like the birth of a, a child that got in the way of continuing it. Jessica Radke was the first one, first of several to bring up uh, board games. And, uh, and she says, uh, King of Tokyo and Dixit are, uh, are, are weeknight games for her, which Max and I have definitely played both of those and many, many others that are great. Uh, Terry Bass, uh, dog and cat behavior issues. Uh, again, anything that really is fascinating to you. Angela uh, Nording, uh, collecting coins from early U.S. history. That's awesome. Rick Geyser, uh, this one's wild. Collect music performed by athletes and sports personalities. Uh, I didn't know there was uh, that much that you could collect. I'm like, what? Um, the Super Bowl shuffle was the, kind of the only thing I could think of. But he has thousands of songs performed by athletes. Of course, Shaq. Uh, he lists a, a big collection and has actually appeared on a lot of different shows, uh, radio shows and whatnot, talking about his collection. Uh, he appears regularly on radio shows around the country talking on that topic. Amazing. Uh, Jack Barnett. Uh, he wrestled professionally for the last 10 years and, uh, oh, and spent the last 10 years being a real-life superhero, uh, plus collecting toys. Now, that's unique, being a real-life superhero. That is something that actually John Ronson has written about in his book, um, the, I think it was the John, or Lost at Sea, where John Ronson hangs out with some of these so-called real-life superheroes that uh, they do get geared up, they, go, they are in costume, and they go out to really rough parts of different cities and and try to stop crime that's it, it's a very uh it's a tough one like it's a suspenseful chapter to read uh amazing stuff though uh and and very fascinating uh who was that jack that that you do that uh angel keel is a twin peaks an og twin peaks collector is a even appeared on some twin peaks dvds a big drop of rain hits the forehead. Heidi Stotts, the crime channel. <laughs> and there's a lot of people that love true crime, unsolved uh, murders and whatnot. Those stories are fascinating. And Tim Araujo chimed in on this as well uh, because he said mafia stories uh, intrigues him. Next week, we will be talking about haunted locations that have mafia ties. Obviously, we'll be talking about some Chicago stuff, but uh, L.A. Uh, we had a, an L.A. Uh, hit location. The first hit in L.A. was one of our stops. And it was conducted by Bugsy Siegel and some other people from Murder Incorporated. So we will tell that story and some other good good stories next week. Um, my goodness, there was so many uh, that I'm not going to be able to get to all of them. Uh, Dr. Ned, I always want love to give him a shout out. Uh, uh, rock from the 1950s and 60s. So let's get some music in there. All right. Um, it goes on and on and on. So I love that so many people responded. Actually, Denise Gazzardo, I wanted to give her a shout out and thanks for uh, chiming in the Hallmark Channel. 
So very a wide range here. But uh, that is its own different, its own unique cult of storytelling and of people that are really dedicated fans. And Denise is one of the few people I've ever met in my life who I could say, yes, I will vouch for her. She is psychic. Uh, she came along back when um, on WCKG uh, AM uh, 105.9, I think it was, in Chicago. We did a live on the air ghost tour for six hours on Halloween night. And the radio station brought in a psychic, which I think was the first time I'd ever talked to somebody who, who said they were psychic. And, um, and she was picking up on stuff. Like my research had spent a long, long time digging up and she was able to walk into a place. And she didn't know. I was the one that set the tour. Uh, she didn't know where we were going, and she was picking up on stuff that was amazing. So, Denise Gazzardo, if you're looking, she she used to live in northern Illinois. I don't know if she still does. Oh, and Bart uh, shouts out. Uh, oh, yeah, so T. Krulos has a book on real-life superheroes, and Bart uh, mentioned that Mike and Wendy, see you on the other side, podcast, did an episode on that. I'm guessing that's the same story. I'm guessing uh, that was T that was on. I, I, remember, I always remember T for, um, he's, he's the guy, he's one of the people that give the, uh, haunted Milwaukee tours. He did a book, a great book on doomsday preppers as well, which is its own really wild thing. And he spent, boy, like one of the last things this guy did before everything shut down was attend flat earth rallies and conventions. <laughs> so uh, this guy, just like John Ronson, go just dive head first into these really bizarre, like counterculture type of worlds and then write about them. As we've uh, chatted quite a bit already, and again, thank you everybody who, who is hanging out and talking with us, and I'm, I'm always down to talk more nerd, geek uh, topics, board games especially, um, on and on and on. Uh, there was so much interest in this that uh, maybe we've got to do a part two. I'm from the Midwest. I live in the Midwest again now. I lived for um, eight years in California. I lived for five years in Hawaii, so I've actually never lived east at all i've i've lived very west <laughs> um for a big chunk of my life but it's been i've been very lucky that with my work i get to sometimes uh travel the country back when the world was more opened up and in the process of doing so i would always try to do little side trips you know like i gotta go cover the the uh, tribeca film festival but you know what the chelsea hotel is near here so if i've got time in between my schedule of doing interviews and doing red carpets, I'm going to walk around to whatever haunted place I could find. By the way, Lower Manhattan is awesome. If you haven't been and if you're probably on this chat, you probably would be the right kind of person because you are constantly stumbling across uh, real-life shooting locations from the movie Ghostbusters. And uh, that happened constantly without trying to. I stumbled across the, the firehouse stumble across the library where that opens the movie and you see the big lion like oh gosh the camera swoops right past there talk about geeking out that was me in new york i can't believe nobody brought up whiskey that's something people geek out over i'm not a total geek on it but i can i can hold my own a little bit if it's about evan williams i'm all over it and the first one i'll talk about is gore orphanage now this is i mean first off what about it? what a name gore orphanage uh this is in northern ohio right on the river right by sandusky ohio so uh theme park fans and people geek, definitely geek out about theme parks too uh theme park fan, fans might know it um for cedar point uh this is very close to cedar point and the story really goes and, and this is basically one of those cases where there is the ruins of a building set back in the woods and people invent stories around it and especially when the, the actual name is Gore Orphanage Road. Now, a gore is a section of land that's kind of a no man's land that's between different uh, jurisdictions. So gore doesn't mean gory. It's not a gorge either. It's just kind of like this little strip of land that's a buffer between districts. So that's what a gore is. And, of course, there, there was an orphanage in this vicinity at one point in time. And so people found the ruins of this large house left behind and just assumed that this must have been an orphanage once upon a time. And then these urban legends came from it talking about a massive fire that burned down and all of these children died here. Um, so an interesting thing is we know, this is one of those rare instances also where we actually know a lot of the real, real history of this place. And this place, uh, a family lived here in the spiritualist era. They actually did uh, seances at this location and there were they did have at least one child who died on the land so this place is not by all means a cheery location in general 
uh, but it, it's got its stories, but it's not an orphanage that burned down. So people talk about uh, hearing the sound of children crying here. I'm sure there are many other, since it's an urban legendy location, there's probably claims of just about everything. But one of the really common ones is uh, ghost children or the sounds of crying. And uh, <clears throat> so Wendy and I were traveling from, from here in the Midwest, we were heading out to Baltimore, and I was trying to find the most interesting places um, in Ohio to visit on the way. Hoping that I couldn't, I could find stuff that's you know within a couple hours of going detouring off the highway, and then lo and behold, I find this location. I think, oh gosh, th I want to go here so bad. I hope it's remotely close because Ohio's kind of a de deceptively big state, and wouldn't you know it, it was like 10 minutes off the highway, very easy to get to, and you're going down these very small and getting smaller winding roads that are going more and more remote into. Uh, farm field-ish type areas, forested areas. <clears throat> and, you know, you kind of don't exactly know where you're going. I hope the GPS signal holds out or is this going to be the beginning of a horror movie? Um, and then we finally get to the end of the road and what did you know what a park ranger is sitting there. I'm like, ah, oh, geez, we find it. But there's an authority figure that's probably just going to shoo us out immediately. So what a bust. This sucks. <laughs> Maybe on the way back. Um, so, you know, rather than just try to ignore each other, I walked up to him. I, I said, listen, we're historians, we're on a cross-country road trip, and I, I heard a legend about this location. Am I in the right place? And I think it's the second, and, and who's to say, he may not have ever shooed us away, but I think if you go to uh, someone like that, hat in hand, saying, can you help us, uh, then they're very happy to play expert and show you around. And it's like, oh yes, and so-and-so, and he was telling the story, and like, if you go down this path right here, and he's like, and it's okay if we do that? And like, yeah, go for it, sweet. Um, but here's the best part. He said, you know, really the scariest, most haunted location in this area, you just drove past it. Uh, there's a little one lane bridge that went over a, a small Creek river type thing. Um, that's, that's the place you want to check out. This is really not that big of a deal, but that place is scary. And he basically told a La Llorona type of story. Um, and, and that is the legend. It's a crybaby bridge. Crybaby bridges are a phenomena across the country. And it's a very common folk tale, if you will, about a woman who, there are different variations, but whatever the case, the, at the end of the day, a woman has lost a child who had died and is now um, looking for her. Maybe she's angry. Maybe she's sorrowful. It's usually very much a sad story. Uh, obviously, it's a sad story. Um, a remorseful uh, mother who lost her child. In addition to visually seeing a, a woman, uh, sometimes you'll be encountered by her. And again, like I said it could be a scary thing or it could be a sad thing but you'll frequently hear crying coming from the <clears throat> tucson has one of these as well i mean really they're all over but coming from emanating up from the river and um and so that's what i had heard and i, I figured that he was just going to continue to echo that story but he said uh just about a week or two ago one of my partners was traveling over that bridge and he pulled up to it <clears throat> and there was this fog this cloud that was just kind of like sitting hovering over the bridge clear everywhere else but a fog over the bridge which again trying to debunk things and rationalize things there's water underneath it i don't know why it would only be foggy on top of the bridge but some atmospheric thing could surely be playing a part of that um so the person apparently especially knowing the legends right took a minute sat there looked at it but then decided to proceed and he said out of the out of this fog that he was driving through a hand appeared Actually, not a hand, a hand didn't appear, but a handprint appeared on his window through the mist, through this uh, thick haze. And as the vehicle continued to drive, it dragged, went up the window, and as he continued, it went along all the windows on the side. As if a phantom person was just standing there and pet the, their car as it went by. And of course, it was visible because it was also wet with fog and smeared that handprint all along the side of the vehicle. Whoa, how <laughs> intense. Um, so Wendy and I did, we first went back to the ruins of this building. Uh, shout out to Dan Malone, who I always feel like I have to give uh, credit and appreciation to as he taught me how to find ruins and, and uh, look around and what to be looking for all the time. So yeah, we, we went there, we did a, an EVP session. We uh, took readings with EMF, nothing, nothing happened. Uh, the really interesting thing that I guess could have happened was I was still, even though we know that there was not an orphanage back here, I was still 
sometimes with some of my questions trying to uh, reach out to an orphan, to lost children. Uh, not because they were there, but because enough people had come here uh, with that thought in their head that maybe it had, could possibly create a haunting. Um, in the end, again, nothing paranormal happened, unfortunately. We did go back as well to the bridge, and I, we, we filmed a little bit at the bridge, uh, telling the stories. Nothing happened there as well. I wish, you know, most of the time things don't happen, but I just love going to all these wild places. Um, <clears throat> the Heading out to New York, heading back to New York, as I was talking about it earlier, um, again, Tribeca Film Festival is really what brought me out there for the most part, why I spent most of the time out there that I spent out there. And one of the, sometimes you get invited to um, um, parties, rap parties, uh, premiere parties, really, even as a member of the press to continue to like, I mean, they're courting you. They want you to write about their movie or interview their stars and whatnot, and they, they want to get the press out there. So one of these uh, organizations, um, oh my gosh, it's so, I should be at least given the credit of of saying the name of the show, the movie. It was um, it was a really dark movie, and I think dark was part of it, uh, a drama, very heavy. They held a party up on the rooftop bar of this building called the James Hotel. Uh, just amazing. Like you could, it felt like you were in the Edison. If there's any LA people watching it, it just had that vibe of early 1900s uh, industrial. Somewhat industrial, I guess, uh, but just a locked-in-time location. It was a really an awesome place. And I couldn't help but while I was there, you know, even though I'm at a party, I don't know how to party. So I'm on my phone, I'm Googling, and I'm researching the history of this building. And lo and behold, when the Titanic went down, uh, they pulled up as many survivors as they could, of course, and they brought people back to, I don't know if they brought everybody back to America, but they brought in a lot of people to America, and they as the lawsuit was unfolding over the course of weeks, uh, they sequestered all of the survivors of the Titanic in this building. So this is this was full in 1912 of people that were pulled out of the freezing uh, Arctic. And this is where they lived as they were, oh gosh, grappling with everything that they just experienced. I mean, talk about PTSD, uh, people that have lost loved ones, on and on, and then having to like immediately go into a, a court battle over everything as well. Um, so there are lots of hauntings associated with that location of that time period. The thing that's very interesting to me is who's haunting it? Is it people that experience this and their trauma is what's left behind? Or did people pass away in the ocean and they still follow their loved ones back and for whatever reason are continuing to remain in that place? Uh, very fascinating and just a really, really cool location in, in um, southern um, Manhattan. Uh, another place, like I mentioned, the Chelsea Hotel, I couldn't help myself. I had to go check it out. This is a, a location steeped with history, pop culture history, and mystery because this is where, well, we'll just say Nancy died from the Sex Pistols. We don't really know what happened. Uh, did Sid kill Nancy? There's a lot of different theories and there's a lot of drugs, so it's hard to be really uh, factual about anything. And I would love for this place to become more open and available for paranormal experience, uh, for paranormal investigations. As it was a few years ago when I was there, it was a uh, an apartment building. And th I mean, they must have so many people that like me want to go and look around, check out the history. They had a ton of different signs saying no cameras allowed in here. Like, well, that sucks. Took pictures of the outside, but still I walked into the lobby because the best person you could always talk to at a haunted location is a security guard. So I go in and there's a security guard sitting behind the desk and I ask him, you know, I just got to the chase, you know, are there any ghost stories here? He's like, oh man, we got everything. We got suicides, we got murders. It just went on and on about the, like the horribleness of this location. Uh, didn't really seem to know anything about the hauntings, but he's like, dude, we have every horrible thing that one person could do to another or themselves happens here. I mean, just the, the amount of OD, uh, overdose, dr deaths over history. Um, so many of the beat poets in that era and moving forward have an important connection. So any place that has a lot of creativity associated with it as well, I think, is a place that, like you talk about, all theaters being haunted, or it seems like all theaters are haunted. Uh, I think creativity feeds into that, the fact that people are opening themselves up and, and that kind of energy is going out there. And maybe that kind of energy lingers more than some other types. But the best part of being at the Chelsea was as I was kind of wrapping up, because I was, I was geared up because I was at the film festival. So I had 
a camera and tripod and microphones and all this slung over my shoulders. And this elderly guy, a resident, walks in. And he says, he looks at my stuff and he says, are you here to talk to the ghosts? I'm like, yeah, sure. He's like, there's a lot of them talking, but not a lot of people listening. And then he kind of creepily walked away. Like, what is that guy living with? What is in his apartment? Um, is he a nut? Possibly. But also, who knows? Maybe he's a guy that actually has experiences and is hoping that other people will actually come and ask some questions. Uh, the, um, oh, the, the promising thing with the Chelsea is, like I said, it was an apartment building when I was there three years ago, maybe it was, four now. Um, I guess it would be 40 years ago. Uh, while I was there, they were renovating half the building to be hotel space. So hopefully, I mean, everything's pretty much shut down now, but hopefully soon, I don't know if the renovations are done, but ideally we can go there, we can rent a room and do some investigations. Uh, Bart, this is what Scott does so well. He underlined the urban legends with the actual historical history and overlapping parts. He does this throughout voices. Thank you so much. That's so super kind of you. I'm actually touched by that. Um, one of the other comments that uh, on my book, not to be touting my book, but I guess I should, I'm so bad at self-promoting, is somebody, somebody on an online review talked about how I break the fourth wall at the right times. And I think that's cool. Like, I love to go in and tell the story. I, I try to tell it like a journalist telling a news story. I try to interview the witnesses and take photos of the locations. Um, but really, I don't know. I, 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 I try to use the inverted pyramid style. I try to not get too dry about it. Uh, but just, you know, keep it to the story and let the story unfold. Uh, let, it, let it tell its own story, not try to be too active about it. But there, are, there were a handful of occasions where something happened when I was there. And then I like to break the fourth wall and just say, and by the way, here's what I can vouch for personally. And yes, that old man is amazing. That, the, the, the old man in the Chelsea, I thought when this was happening, there are those moments in life where you're like, if a screenwriter was here, he would say, I could never write that because it's too perfect. It doesn't seem realistic. But that actually happened. <laughs> And I, I remember on that kind of a note, I wrote a, a screenplay that kind of played with a bunch of the stories from my book. And I, I sent it to a good friend who's an executive at some big, he, he's worked in some huge places. And he highlighted some of the location descriptions and wrote, oh, come on. As if I was being too over the top with my description, but like, no, that's actually what this place looked like. That's what the Sunnybrook Asylum actually was like. That was the actual graffiti we found. I wasn't being insane here. I wasn't, I wasn't being a bad storyteller. I was being an actual uh, accurate storyteller. Key West. Key West, oh my gosh. Uh, I cannot wait for the world to be a safe place again because I cannot wait to go back to Key West, Florida. Uh, the most southern location. Oh, Mark Johnson said, I just ordered your book. Self-motion skills might be better than you thought. I appreciate that so much, Mark, and I, I very much want to sign it when, whenever we see each other next. Um, and hopefully there'll be some awesome uh, paranormal conferences in the Twin Cities at one point coming up. Abigail, I just ordered your book. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, should get it by the end of next week. Anyway, so uh, Key West is the, it's the last island on that chain of islands uh, going off the tip of Florida. It is the, I think it's the furthest southern point that's still considered part of the continental U.S. Uh, it's just, and, and you might think, with good debate that the most famous resident of Key West is Ernest Hemingway, in which he very famously lived there for a time. Ha ha. But Mark is one step ahead of me. But really, the other most famous resident is Robert the Doll. I do have to admit, I did not visit Robert the Doll. I, I planned on it. He's kind of more on the, like when you just barely, because it's like just a series of bridges connecting all these islands. And when you look at it, like when you really look at Key West on a map, you think, how does this exist at all? How have these not all just been wiped clean by hurricanes? And some of them have, unfortunately. Uh, but it is such a fragile little uh, chain of islands. But the Maritime Museum, where Robert is located, because he's this old doll in a sailor's uniform, and I'll, I'll tell his story in a bit here. Um, he's kind of in that place right, like you barely are on the island yet. But most of the activity, most of downtown Key West is at the other end. And that's where we stayed. But I was there with my, uh, my parents and they were totally game. I, I told them about Robert the Doll and they're like, yeah, we go to that, check that out. They're, um, my mom has been always insanely supportive of me and she was my, uh, my author, uh, my editor, I should say, when I wrote my books. Uh, so 
huge debt of gratitude forever for, to her. And she's also a history nut that uh, helped, I think, foster that in me as well. But then we did a, a ghost tour, a, a really wonderful walking tour of Key West. And the, the guide really in deep, in depth, told the story of Robert the Doll. And my parents seemed a lot less interested to see, <laughs> see this, uh, this creature. Uh, for themselves afterwards once they learned about all the different curses associated with them. And, you know, honestly, I'm on a road trip with my parents. Why test it? I know, um, you know, like just like Virginia Madsen, back when she was promoting Candyman, she wouldn't look in a mirror and say Candyman because, you know, why, why tempt fate? Um, and I kind of felt the same way, especially uh, with my folks uh, behind the wheel, uh, you know, just being on the road with my parents. So, but the story is this family lived in this house and this young boy who was probably 10 or 12 uh, started acting up a lot. They would hear all sorts of chaos and noise and ruckus and assume the kid was playing too loudly and he would blame his doll. He said, no, that wasn't me doing it, it was Robert. And, and sure enough, they eventually would hear sounds and voices while their son was still with them while just Robert was upstairs. <clears throat> and so, you know, this doll seemed to be moving on its own volition, uh, people would see it, I think, even from outside looking into the window, seeing this doll, like Chucky. There's a lot of uh, rumor and legend that Child's Play was based on this doll, which I, I think that's not true, but you could really understand how people came to that conclusion. Um, dolls seriously creep me out, says Abigail, uh, whether haunted or not. Max, I, was, I almost talked about this story. Uh, we went to a haunted plantation in Tennessee, in central Tennessee. Um, the Carnville Plantation or something like that. Max took the creepiest photo of Civil War, a Civil War era doll uh, in this haunted plantation uh, that became like an amputation hospital as well. Super, super creepy. I just always think of that when I think about creepy dolls, that photo that Max took. Oh, and in addition to like moving around and making noises and making sounds and I think even like creepily giggling, other toys would be massacred. Um, just, I mean, imagine if uh, if Woody in Toy Story 1 really was killing Buzz and then <laughs> knocking off all the other toys one after the next. It's like the most demented Toy Story movie ever. So they eventually put this doll up in the attic, just coordinate away, and sure enough, they do continue to hear sounds up there. He was reunited with his doll later in life and continued to um, just kind of keep it. I don't know. I don't remember. I think there were stories that he would talk with the doll as he created his art. Whether that's just an eccentric artist or if the doll was answering back, we don't really know. The really interesting thing today is that that house in Key West, Florida is an Airbnb. So you could rent out and stay in the room that Robert the Doll haunted. Wonderful coincidental thing that also happened while I was out in Key West is we walked from our hotel down to the beach. And we saw like, oh gosh, there's a really cool looking, kind of almost a New Orleans style uh, cemetery near our hotel. So we'll... We'll have to swing by that on the way back. And we do, and we're looking around. And I didn't even think about it, but we just stumbled across the grave of the boy who had Robert. Uh, we found his grave just kind of on accident. So I did an EVP session there. Uh, nothing happened. Uh, I didn't get anything. But I, I always think that's a great point to bring up is people might always be going to see Robert the doll at the museum, which I still have more to talk about on that, or maybe doing an EVP session or doing an investigation at the house where, that Robert haunted. Um, I don't know how many people are thinking to go to Otto's gravesite and try to make contact. Maybe Robert the doll's spirit is also hanging out by his body. Who knows? Uh, these are all things that are just worth looking into. I know nothing. None of us really know nothing, <laughs> anything, <laughs> excluding proper grammar. Um, so you might as well be investigating everywhere, even places that don't have reported hauntings yet. So Robert the doll, it's not just a historical haunting. There are current modern day, almost like Annabelle, very similar to Annabelle. Um, where this is seemingly a very dark doll that still has some intensely dark energy associated with it. Um, it is said that if you go to this museum and want to take picture, take a picture of Robert, you have to ask permission first. I mean, he's not going to answer you. So you ask permission. You, you come hat in hand. You be humble about it. Um, you know, it takes me back to working in Hawaii. I worked on so many different movie sets, movie and TV show sets. Um, that the first day before you get your first shot, you do a blessing. You have a holy man come out and bless the set. You're not really supposed to do anything until you ask permission to do something. And again, you're not really going to get a, oh, go for it. Uh, you're not going to get your uh, filming permits co-signed or anything like that, but it's just the proper protocol. And, um, and I will say that only twice have I ever worked on a set where we didn't get it blessed beforehand 
and bad stuff did happen immediately. Um, on one movie, I think in both cases, the guy just couldn't get there until midday. So it's not like we shot for half a half the show and something weird happened. But um, on one, it was called The Killing of John Lennon. We were shooting in this, um, this storefront and right where we're about to get the first shot. There's, and I can't remember, it's a Chapman dolly. I can't remember the exact name of it, but it's this huge heavy duty piece of machinery. Uh, the hydraulics burst and the cameraman and the camera came crashing to the ground. And then we had hydraulic fluid all over the store that we had to clean up, which was a huge delay. And we ended up not getting a first shot off until after the place actually ended up getting uh, blessed anyway. And then on flight 29 down in one of our seasons, um, I can't remember if it was season two or three, uh, same type of thing where we couldn't get the guy in early enough and then a huge windstorm came and some trees fell down around our set so yeah get your get your uh set blessed and ask robert the Dolph for permission uh because apparently you'll be cursed by something super negative it could be car accidents it could be very very deadly uh the the results and the most wonderful photo i've seen of robert the doll super easy to find if you just google do an image search for robert the doll you'll see a photo of him in the foreground and in the background is a wall full of letters asking forgiveness of robert from people that have apparently felt his wrath zach asked uh, interviewed a lady who took a pic without permission and had nothing but misfortune afterwards co coincidence or, or curse who is to say who is to say and you know if somebody has the belief that like i'm doing something bad Maybe you're manifesting it yourself. I mean, really, everything's up there. Um, you might as well. You might as well ask permission. I, you know, again, I don't really. You know, you talk about belief. How much belief can create? Do I believe that Robert the Doll will come come after me? No, I guess I don't believe it. But would I still ask permission? Yes, I would. <laughs> Last one. Uh, we're gonna talk about the Sensabaugh Tunnel in in um, okay, Church Hill, Tennessee, which is in the northern e northeast portion of Tennessee. Uh, Beautiful country, absolutely beautiful country. The Sensabaugh Tunnel has, again, a very gore orphanage style urban legend associated with it. Uh, this is, and it also makes me think of the, um, the Bunny Man Bridge, which is a whole nother, I should have included that in here too. Just not, too many stories, not enough time. It's a train tunnel that the cars go underneath and the train passes over top and it is super remote. You are, you are in some very isolated country when you're out here. But the legend is that this farmhouse that's nearby was robbed one night. And in the process of being robbed, a little baby was also kidnapped. And the burglars were, they were found out, they were caught. So they had to hightail it and they were running and they ended up running through this, uh, this tunnel, which is right by a river. And this river is constantly, basically the tunnel is a tributary of the river. There's water just constantly going through this, this road. Um, and so they end up ditching the kid, who is, again, less than a toddler, is an infant, and the child ends up drowning in a puddle. Burglars get away, child dies, and now this area is haunted by the spirit of this moment, whether it's the child or the moment. Again, this is the type of thing that you'd be able to find out through records. So we know that this didn't happen. Uh, but still, I think there's always a lot of power in a location. If a lot of people are visiting it, and they embody these concepts, these, this terror, the, these feelings, these ideas, these uh, visuals. I think enough people, especially over decades, you mark a place, you, be, you force a place to become haunted. Uh, when, oh, and of course, it's got the same cliche, and it's just the, the biggest red flag that, oh, clearly this is an urban legend. Uh, it's got the, the legend that if you go in, turn your vehicle off, it won't turn back on. Um, I th I'm sure that there are versions of it where it says you're pushed out by unseen hands, that kind of a story. Uh, but, but we tested it. We, I went in there, and this is a road. I mean, it's not a very busy road, but I still went in there, and I shut the vehicle off, took the keys out, back in, did it a number of times. It started up every time. Uh, what would I have done if it didn't start up? I would have freaked out. That would have been really weird. And then, you know, <laughs> then you're trying to get your vehicle off the road before uh, traffic comes through this dark tunnel and and blindsides you. Um, but an interesting thing, we did investigations on both sides of the tunnel and within the tunnel itself. Uh, one interesting thing happened that I heard children laughter at one point. I, um, I think very clearly, very like I'm 99.99% sure that it was a weird play of the echo of water trickling down these rocks, also echoing through this tunnel. Acoustics are fantastic. Um, just like what can happen acoustically 
It makes me think of also the domes of Casa Grande, uh, Arizona. This was near where my parents used to have a house down uh, towards Sarita, south of Tucson. And it's these amazing geometric domes that were built in the 1970s for some tech company that never, they must have gone out of business. They never moved in there. And so now th these huge domes, and, and again, huge, they look like spaceships, UFOs that landed. And one of the, them is kind of a caterpillar shape, just one dome connected to the next. And I walked into it and an amazing acoustic thing happened where I thought the ground was crumbling below my feet. I didn't know if there was a basement. I thought I was about to free fall, but it sounded like the ground was crumbling underneath me. But what was happening was my footsteps were coming in and in this caterpillar series of domes, every step was then echoing multiple times coming back to me as it was hitting the different edges of the building. So man, you can have tricks played on you with acoustics very strongly. So I think that's what the, the laughter sound was uh, that I heard, I, I'm pretty sure. And I could understand if somebody out there, especially in the middle of the night, they're creeping themselves out. Maybe it's a high school dare type of thing. It sounded like laughter, but I'm pretty sure it was just water sound effects. Okay, so thank you everybody that that uh, that joined. Um, I always love doing these. I hope you guys enjoy them too. Next week, we are going to be talking about mafia stories. Haunted places associated with the mob, whether it's Chicago or we're going to be talking about Bugsy out in Los Angeles where he set up shop and where he met his violent end. Um, but if anybody ever has any comments, suggestions on places you want to talk about, um, themes you want me to cover, I, I'm here to talk to you guys. So I'm really happy to customize any program for my wonderful, wonderful audience. Thank you all once more for joining. Uh, check out the Fantastic Story Society. We, again, just recently posted a great interview with Kathy Kressel, who, if you're into crime stories, we talk some Rockford, Illinois, unsolved and sometimes solved crimes. Really good, great storyteller. And, um, and again, the, the two preceding that were also great, John Ronson, Men Who Stare at Goats, DJ McHale, uh, um, Are You Afraid of the Dark? Um, thank you, everybody, for watching, and I'll see you next week.